do that. Scary. All right, don't no, no worry. We okay with that. And then you edit it. Put a prettier face on the narrator, okay? You put a pretty face. No, and you know that I record it for review. And I know. So if, so if young doctor want to learn how to deal with like hypertension, like Ryan say, or deal with the heart failure, like Dr. Mark say, they mm -hmm. can read it, they can view it, and they can own the experience for that. Oh, that's so, great. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I uh, more right. the more people we get this information to, the better. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. happy for that. All right. Um. Here we go. Yeah. Here we go. Good morning. Chat. What are you saying? <laughs> How are you, Nung? Nice to see you. Good I'm fine. Good. Welcome. Well, uh, should we should we get started so you guys don't have to suffer more than an hour with me? Yeah, let's start. That, let's start. Yeah, let's right. start. We're gonna start with some questions really quickly. Can everyone see the questions on my screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's, not, it's not fancy. I didn't, uh, I'm not going to send out a poll. So you can uh, just say out loud what you think the answer is. Uh, I, I will read the stem and then you can pick either A, B, C, or D. So a 52 year old patient presents to the ER with worsening shortness of breath. Which of the following uh, findings on bedside ultrasound suggest heart failure as a cause of his shortness of breath? Dùng mũi mũi điểm, để ngay mũi điểm, để mũi mũi tắt tiếng của em đi gần điện, tắt tiếng của em điện ơi. Okay, Matt, thank you. I'm sorry about that. Don't be sorry at all. Don't be sorry. Okay, let's my, my Vietnamese is so good. I could tell that you were asking someone to mute their computer. Oh wow, really nice. Yeah, I know what I know what you all say about me behind my back when you think I don't understand. <laughs> Okay, so what do we think? So we know that B lines show consolidation, whether it's a due to a pneumonia, tuberculosis, or in this case, pleural edema. And so because of that, we can really get rid of A and B on this. And so in a patient with heart failure, because of, or dyspnea because of heart failure, do you think the IVC, Inferior vena cava would collapse or be very large and swollen. Yeah, I agree. Very, very large and swollen. So uh, the correct answer is, is C. You'll see B lines. You'll see a plethoric or swollen, non collapsible uh, inferior vena cava and decreased E point septal separation. This is something we'll go over during the lecture. This just means that uh, the annulus is not moving very much on the heart when you do an echo. So don't worry if you didn't, if you don't get these right, uh, hopefully we'll cover them during uh, the lecture today. Okay, question two, which of the following classes of heart failure carry the highest mortality? And so this is a little critical thinking. Think about pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and uh, cardiac index and what you think that means for a patient. I'll give you a second. I'll open the chat box here. Wow, you guys are so smart. I'm going to make you careful. I'm going to make you all lecture to me next time. You're absolutely right. So the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be increased again because blood is not moving through the heart very well, raising the pressure in the pulmonary vein or artery, excuse me. And the cardiac output or the index will be decreased because the heart is, the ejection fraction is reduced. And so the correct answer here is A increased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and decreased cardiac index. Okay, question three. I'll let you read it all yourselves. When I see some answers in the chat box, we can talk a little bit more. 
Sorry, I'm using all of these acronyms that you may not be familiar with. Okay, so I'm seeing some answers. Excellent. We're going to want to use non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Intubating a patient like this will kill them. We need to help uh, uh, push the pleural edema out of the lungs. And we can do that using uh, BiPAP. Okay, very good. Okay, last but not least, question four. Is everyone in agreement? Excellent, yes. We want uh, afterload and preload reduction with this patient, but in this particular case, afterload. And the vasodilator we need is nitroglycerin. So answer A is correct. You guys aced this, excellent job. Uh, I am going to close this and uh, open our lecture. So, okay. Okay, does everyone see the screen without the notes on it? Good. Good. All right, so acute heart failure. Uh, this is a lecture that uh, my colleague, Dr. Mike Morgan created when uh, Dr. Dai, uh, Dr. Morgan and, uh, and myself started this program, uh, boy, back in 2015 or 16, right Dai? And it's been updated. Dr. West updated it. He apologizes that he's not able to be here tonight, but uh, one of our colleagues got a very significant head injury, was riding a bike and got a subdural hematoma when she fell. And so he is covering for her tonight. So uh, he asked me to deliver the lecture tonight. So we're gonna talk about acute heart failure. This is something that we in, uh, in Utah in particular don't see very much of. Uh, so it's a good review for me as well. Um, it really is just a complex clinical syndrome that uh, is very uh, uh, complex in its physiology, but has some pretty simple acute interventions that we can do in the emergency department. Um, I think it's something that uh, once you have a good handle on, um, you really are, are more comfortable treating. Uh, how many of you treat, have treated a heart failure patient this week? Can you raise your hand if you've treated a heart failure patient this week? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, for me, it's been probably two or three weeks. And this is just because in, in Utah, patients are very healthy. They don't smoke. They're not very obese. But where I'm from in the center part of the country, in Iowa, people are very fat. They smoke a lot. They drink a lot of beer. And so heart failure is a lot more common. And because of that, I, I don't see very much of it. So uh, um, it, it, like I said, it's a great review. Um, only two to 3% of adults uh, over 45 uh, have heart failure. Um, but about 20% of us will go on to develop heart failure at some point before we die. And in America, it's the, one of the leading causes of hospital admission in patients uh, in the elderly. Um, most patients who present to the ER with heart failure get admitted, at least in the United States. Is that similar in, in Vietnam? Or are you sending patients home with heart failure? Anyway. I think yeah. the, the same in your country, but uh, yeah. uh, in Vietnam, some uh, 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 some patients with uh, heart failure uh, can stay at home, but uh, some patients with acute heart failure, they have to go to hospital and right. stay in hospital. I think it's the same you. But then in Vietnam, uh, uh, more and more patients with acute heart failure Right. Um, nowadays, uh, because uh, um, uh, our lifestyle changes many uh, years uh, later, many many years ago. So I think it mm, a lot of patients with hypertension, with um, and a lot of patients with uh, um, uh, um, uh, 
Uh, heart disease. Uh, heart disease. More you're and absolutely more. right. Okay. Yes. You're absolutely right. And in fact, uh, Dr. Howe, that's a very astute observation because uh, as, uh, as uh, the diet in Vietnam changed and habits changed, uh, you probably had more salt in your diet and more processed foods and more smoking. And that, you're right, led to more heart disease and more people surviving with heart disease leads to a greater preponderance of heart failure in the general population. Yeah, um, that's right. So that's right. Thank you. It's not not surprising. Yeah, and I, I really like that point. That's a great point. Um, I also want to underscore that these patients don't tend to do very well. Uh, patients with heart failure die, uh, half of them within five years of their diagnosis. So it's not it's not an inconsequential thing. And as as Dr. Howe pointed out, the population is of of those uh, living with heart failure is is growing quite a bit, uh, mostly because of uh, our uh, improvements in care for patients who have myocardial infarction or heart attack. But I, I really was interested in what the data showed in Vietnam, and I, I couldn't find a lot of it. The, the World Health Organization publishes a little bit of it, but I, I did find this study that was actually out of uh, Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, it was published in 2019, and, I, and it, in, in its introduction, it had some very interesting data that uh, shows that uh, about 15% of your hospitalizations within the city of Ho Chi Minh City are, are due to acute heart failure, which I, I thought was really, really impressive. And, and similar to uh, admission rates uh, in the general population overall in America. So uh, I, I found that really intriguing. And I, and I wonder if that mirrors uh, uh, other places uh, uh, around your country. Um, certainly, there's some data, if you look up here, it's suggestive of, of similar events in Southeast Asia elsewhere, in Indonesia and Malaysia, also in Taiwan. So, uh, and, and not surprisingly, people, as they get more fat, uh, they develop diabetes and hypertension, and these changes in lifestyle, they're more sedentary, they develop heart failure. So, anyway, uh, the pathophysiology of heart failures is very complex. Uh, it deals with the renin and angiotensin system, the sympathetic nervous system. But the takeaway from this very complex slide I want you to take is that it really ends up in reduced cardiac output, uh, hypoperfusion, uh, increases in capillary wedge pressure, like we saw with that question just now, pulmonary congestion, and edema within uh, uh, the lung parenchyma. So this is not, not a very important slide. How do these patients present in, in the emergency department? Well, typically uh, they have some signs of volume overload and that can be uh, peripheral edema like you're seeing here, this is pitting edema. They can be very short of breath. Uh, they can even have a chest X-ray findings like you see here, bilateral uh, fluffy infiltrates that are indicative of uh, significant pulmonary congestion and or flash pulmonary edema. Um, Again, a very simple slide, just talking about ejection fraction simply equals the amount, this is, is more for a kind of a medical student quite level, uh, amount of blood pumped out over amount of blood in chamber is really what we're talking about when we talk about an ejection fraction. How much is normal? Most of us who are healthy have an ejection fraction above 65%. This is what we use for, uh, for a cutoff uh, in America. Uh, but as it decreases, you can see symptoms uh, increase substantially. Uh, and, and some of these patients with an EF of less than 40% will even have symptoms at, at rest. Um, and so this is something that we think about when these patients come in complaining of shortness of breath. We can divide these patients into roughly two categories. There are patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And these are patients with really diastolic dysfunction. They have a ventricle that doesn't relax after constriction. The left ventricle receives blood and can't receive enough because uh, it, uh, the ventricle is stiff and damaged. Uh, and this decreased compliance means that the heart has to, the atria has to push harder to get that blood uh, to ensure adequate filling before, uh, uh, before the heart squeezes again. These patients are very sensitive to preload. And it's, it, this is a far more common occurrence in patients who have chronic hypertension, which leads to ventricular hypertrophy uh, and diastolic dysfunction, impaired filling. These patients often have an EF of over 50% by definition. As I mentioned, they're preload sensitive. The other category is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And this means the heart muscle doesn't contract effectively and less oxygenated blood is pumped out to the rest of the body. Uh, 
this is exacerbated with circulatory stress, like when patients are walking or running, uh, because you get an increase in venous return that the heart can't keep up with and causes a backlog of blood essentially in the pump and tube system. This leads to increased cardiac pressure, pulmonary congestion, and pulmonary edema, or systolic heart failure, as we like to call it or used to be called. These patients have an ejection fraction oftentimes of under 40%. They're very sensitive to uh, uh, afterload. So if afterload is too high, the heart can't adequately eject uh, the blood and compete with that uh, arterial pressure with which it needs to, to distribute the blood throughout the body. Um, again, preload is just the volume of blood in the ventricle at the end of diastole. Afterload is resistance to the ventricles uh, uh, that they must overcome to circulate the blood, okay? Uh, this can be uh, kind of classified into four different categories using something called the forced or class heart failure. It's another way to think about heart failure and really useful in predicting the mortality of patients. Are you all familiar with this? Have you seen this before? And this this really delineates yeah. acute yeah. heart. Yeah, yes, heart. Because, yes. Yeah. In the last book of Massachusetts. Yeah. Exactly. And in the class. We usually use it. Do you daily. great? Yes. Yeah. Thank. I, I think it. I think it helps, especially new learners, to really uh, decide which category their patient fits into. And you'll hear people describe it as warm or dry, cold and dry, warm and wet, cold and wet. And this really corresponds, uh, unfortunately, to patient mortality prognosis. And as you see, those patients who are cold and wet meaning they probably have some component of both diastolic and systolic uh, dysfunction, have a very high mortality, approaching 51%, as you see. So, okay. So how do we diagnose this? Well, a lot depends on the physical exam, right? This is an older paper. I think it's from 2008, but what they did is took a, a bunch of patients and a bunch of studies that uh, had a bunch of patients and found out likelihood ratios for patients presenting with suspected heart failure who went on to have confirmed heart failure. And what you'll see here is that both a history of heart failure was predictive with a very high likelihood ratio. Uh, initial clinical judgment was pretty good too, but also a, an S3 gallop. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I could detect an S3 gallop on my physical exam. I, I wear my stethoscope mostly for decoration. And so are there, are there other adjuncts that could help us with, with diagnosis of, of heart failure in patients? Certainly. Uh, but before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about things that could tip somebody over into an acute heart failure exacerbation. The most common that I see in my emergency department is non-compliance. Patients who have a history of heart failure but don't want to take their diuretic because they don't like that it makes them wake up in the middle of the night to urinate or uh, are not taking their antihypertensives because it, it keeps them from exercising. They feel syncopal or pre-syncopal if they try to exercise on their, their beta blocker. So non-adherence is really an important precipitant. Also patients with, with really poor dietary compliance. Uh, as you all know, Americans like to eat a lot of fat and or salt or drink a lot. And this can, be, uh, this can be difficult for patients on salt or fluid restrictions. We talked about medications. Patients in acute renal failure, uh, the kidneys are super important in, in uh, fluid balance in the body. And so if uh, the fluid disturbance is, uh, or the fluid balance is disturbed by an acute kidney injury, this can tip patients over. Uh, in America, unfortunately, we have a lot of patients, at least in my emergency department, that use methamphetamine or cocaine or alcohol. Uh, this can cause uh, drug-induced cardiomyopathy and really throw people into acute heart failure. Acute myocardial infarction, of course, is one of them. Uh, uh, the systemic demands of, uh, of sepsis or infection can cause uh, acute heart failure. Or, of course, prolonged atrial fibrillation that's left untreated can cause uh, a ventricular exhaustion and heart failure. Thyrotoxicosis is one that I don't see very often. I've seen maybe once or twice. So getting back to diagnosis, uh, EKG, uh, an EKG with atrial fibrillation was uh, found to have a, a very high likelihood ratio uh, for predicting acute heart failure. Uh, acute T-wave changes, not surprising. 
Uh, and a normal EKG actually reduces the likelihood or a baseline EKG without changes reduces the likelihood of, of an acute heart failure exacerbation. What about a chest X-ray? So this is how I learned. Uh, a chest X-ray uh, before ultrasound was really uh, available at the bedside uh, was commonly used to, to diagnose or at least push a, a diagnosis towards heart failure. Uh, classically, these patients would have a really large heart. Uh, and a lot of vascular congestion with interstitial edema on the chest X-ray. Um, likewise, a chest X-ray that is perfectly normal uh, may be uh, more suggestive of another diagnosis, but can't exclude, as you'll see here, uh, the absence of some component of heart failure. So let's look at some chest X-rays really quickly and uh, unmute yourself. And I wanna, I wanna hear what you all think. So tell me about this chest X-ray. What do you think? Is this somebody in acute heart failure? I think um, the heart is it's not big. I think it is have a normal size. Uh, I, but, uh, I agree. Yeah, but the, the lung uh, higher, the uh, lung higher is, is a bit uh, uh, bigger than normal. Very and, good, Dr. Uh, Hannah. I, I agree. This is this is somebody who doesn't have at least a lot of vascular congestion or interstitial edema. Yeah, uh, uh, congestion. Right, and, and here we kind of see the markings laid out uh, uh, and it, the heart size seems normal mm. to me. Uh, the yeah. diaphragm looks really good. There's no pneumothorax, all the bones are in place. Uh, you even see a little gastric bubble. Um, but uh, even that, you know, you mentioned the, the hyalur nodes, is that what you're referring to? I, I don't know if they look terribly ab abnormal there. Again, it, this is just talking about how subjective looking at a chest X-ray can be. Now, what about this in comparison? What do you think? Um, Different, uh, right? You have a big heart. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, so the, the heart looks much bigger in this, in yeah. fact, what I often do is I'll take my fingers and measure how big the heart is. And then if it's greater than half of the hemithorax or one hemithorax, I'd say roughly that is, that is indicative of, of cardiomegaly, which is really what these arrows are trying to show us here. So uh, yes, this is, this is somebody likely with some component of, at, at the very least, ventricular hypertrophy and probably the beginnings of a heart failure exacerbation as you see some vascular congestion over here, even a, a, a thin line probably indicating a, a pleural effusion. So I, I agree. And, uh, what about this? So this is very yes. uh, No waiting uh, suggestion in uh, pulmonary and uh, inflammation in uh, pulmonary uh, too. I agree. This is this is probably it's somebody with pneumonia. flash. Pneumonia. It's mean pneumonia and it, it, uh, yep. chest in, uh, uh, in the lung combines. It, it could be, yes. It, it could be yes. somebody with uh, lung infiltrates and, uh, and a very bad pneumonia and or uh, uh, some component of heart failure. You're exactly right. You're yes. exactly right. <laughs> I'm just reading the comments. Uh, somebody says they like bacon. That's bad news for your, your heart. I like bacon too. I, uh, it's bad news for my heart. It's worse than a cigarette, apparently. So what about this? Um, what, what's this chest x-ray? Very good. I can't trick you, huh? Everyone thought that we were talking about heart failure. This is not heart failure. Well, this is a failure of the heart, but not because of anything but a mechanical issue that being a tension pneumothorax, right? You see how all of the mediastinal structures are being pushed out of the way? So what, what does this patient need? Uh, uh, takes, uh, uh, the patient needs gastro. Yeah, don't wait for your surgeon to put in a chest tube. Just do a needle decompression and save the patient. You need to decompress that chest even with your finger or a scalpel. And then the surgeon can come and put in a chest tube if that's what they need to do. So very good. What about this? 
pneumonia. This, I think you're right, Dr. Howe. I think this is, is far more uh, uh, of an uh, infiltrative process or a pneumonia. Yeah. The, the, on, the only other diagnosis I might consider with this is a, uh, a wedge infarct associated with a very large pulmonary embolism. But I yes. think that's unlikely in this case. I think this is a pneumonia. Uh, in this situation, in our department, uh, we usually take a CT scan to, uh, uh, to, uh, to make a right diagnosis. And mm -hmm. in some situations, the patient uh, sometimes uh, sometime have um, pneumonia with inspiration. inspiration. Yeah. So sometimes we need to... Uh, uh, no, no, it's not people. And, endoscopy. Uh, and endoscopy. Endoscopy to take uh, some... Uh, uh, Culture. Some, uh, yeah, some some uh, some uh, rice, some uh, some sputum. Yeah, some sputum. sputum. Some yes. sputum. Yes. yes, you're you're absolutely right. This yeah. uh, you you in Vietnam are far more advanced than we are. You uh, are, are you have CT. Die always tells me we have CT in three <laughs> minutes, Matt. Three minutes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And I say I wait six hours for my CT scans in my yeah. slow emergency department. Not so good. you're you're right. This this patient needs a, a CT. Absolutely. What about this patient? Uh, this is our heart case. This may be a uh, pulmonary uh, con con consolidation, or maybe yes, uh, some. Uh, Yeah, I, that's a great guess. I, uh, was that Dr. Nung who said that? I can just say yeah, I think this is consoli consolidation. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, so I, I think that this, if we're looking, can you all see my cursor here? I think this is probably uh, a, uh, a plural effusion plural. because it, we see the line so sharply demarcating the, the uh, upper and the lower lobe and the right lung. And so my thought is that this patient has some sort of exudative or transudative process, maybe cancer, that's causing this really, really demarcated line here. So again, the right thing is probably to get a CT scan, but uh, just for, for fun, we're, we're kind of going through these. So, uh, and we, we don't really need to talk about, about this. So. The, the point that uh, I wanted you all to take home was just that this, uh, uh, we cannot rule out uh, a CHF or congestive heart failure or acute heart failure exacerbation with a normal x-ray. It's just one of many tools we can use. And the tool that I like most with somebody that I suspect of acute heart failure is this. So raise your hand if you're using ultrasound in the emergency department to, uh, to rule in or out heart failure. You all are experts in ultrasound. <laughs> uh, you all are, are experts because Dr. Ryan helped teach you in, in ultrasound. And, and now Sorry. you can teach Dr. Ryan and, and Dr. Matt and all the other Americans uh, how, to, how to use the ultrasound right. Um, but when we have an ultrasound in the emergency department and we, we are using it to, to look at somebody who we suspect of having heart failure, there are really three questions that I have been taught to ask. And the first question is, are there signs of, of pulmonary congestion? Okay. And we talked about this. This is what this looks like. Okay. These are B lines, but these are not specific to heart failure. Okay. Remember these, these are not specific to heart failure. This can be found in pulmonary fibrosis. It can be found in uh, pleural uh, effusion. It can be found in tuberculosis. So this is one of the three questions that we have to answer. We see these B lines. Okay. And these really just correspond with the curly B lines that we've, we've used to look for on x-rays. The second question is, is there signs of volume overload? And what should we be looking, where should we be looking for volume overload? We can see IBC. Uh, it's IBC yes. Distinction. Very good. Uh, and, yes, uh, volume overload. Absolutely, absolutely. And so this, gets to the question that we, uh, I think, first had, which uh, was, what are the signs on ultrasound that we need to see? The first one was B lines. The second one is we see a very plethoric IVC, which means it does not collapse. 
It's just an English word that means non-collapsible. Okay, and this is because the right atria is so dilated, so filled with blood that it's unable to pump forward into the right ventricle very well. We're seeing signs of backup. And that's, that's what's going on here. So that's the second question we need to ask ourselves when we're using this, this great tool, ultrasound. And the last question is, what is the left ventricular ejection fraction? Is it low or is it normal? We don't need an exact number. We don't even need to know what it used to look like with the patient. We just need to know, is it normal or is it abnormal? How do, does anyone know how we, how we can do that? Uh, usually we use the eye bombing uh, for this. We look at on the heart, is, a, is it probably good or not, enough or not, uh, equally in, on the uh, ventricular and the epon. We can use the epon uh, from the uh, mitral vein, uh, from the mitral vein uh, movement. And we Very can guess uh, this is good enough. Very good. Yeah, that that is very complex uh, a cardiac ultrasound. You're absolutely right. But there's an even easier way to do it for somebody who's very simple minded like me. And it's really just to look at the mitral valve. You can look simply at the mitral valve in the intraventricular septum and say, is the septum squeeze or is the ventricle squeezing well? And is the mitral valve either hitting? the interventricular septum, or is it just coming out very, very little bit? The less the movement of the mitral valve leaflet, the less the ejection fraction. This is concerning for reduced ejection fraction, and this answers our third question. What do you think about this ultrasound? Does this show normal or reduced? <clears throat> you think normal? You think normal? Why do you think normal, We Look, uh, this is my mitral valve. Uh... That's a good guess. Does, any, Look, does anyone else have, uh, does anyone disagree with Dr. Wee? I know he's a senior doctor there, so you don't want to disagree with him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will, I'm going to disagree. The mitral valve is supposed to be open, open the close, open the close. You're it, right. It, you're right. So this, this is probably somebody with a moderately reduced ejection fraction. And there are two things that I'm looking at here. One, this ventricle, this left ventricle looks very hypertrophied. It looks thicker than most, than, yeah. than, than most ventricles that I see on my ultrasounds. Second, there's not much movement of the interventricular septum. And the, if you look at the leaflet right here, it's only coming out about this far. This, this view is not very good. In somebody with really high ejection fraction, this leaflet should come all the way here and hit the, vent, the, the intraventricular septum. And it is not doing that. And because of that, this person has a reduced ejection fraction. It's just, you say yes or no. And so somebody has B lines, signs of congestion, yes. Somebody has plethoric IVC, yes or no? Does the interventricular septum touch the mitral valve leaflet, yes or no? And so we've answered that this person probably has some component of acute heart failure. Now, is it, does, this, does this exam even work? Can, can we teach people really quickly? And, uh, uh, and, and if so, how does their work compare? And this is a very old study. They were using ultrasounds 20 years ago that probably are nothing like the, the, the ultrasounds that we have now. Even then, teaching residents after one day in transthoracic echo, they had an interrelator reliability agreement, meaning when compared to a trained echocardiographer, they could, they could predict heart failure uh, almost as well as, uh, as uh, a, a, an expert cardiologist. So that's, that's pretty impressive. This is a pretty after you've done it enough and gotten enough feedback, this is a pretty sensitive test, okay? This was repeated uh, uh, about seven years later and uh, even got some support from the American Society of Echocardiography. And so there is reasonable agreement between uh, emergency physicians who do this exam and are trained to do it 
and expert cardiology interpretations just by visually estimating, okay, what we're doing here, just by guessing more or less, not by doing complex echocardiography, measuring of E to A point or anything like that. So, so that's one way, one other way that we can use uh, 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 some adjunct in the ED to, to diagnose uh, uh, heart failure. What about brain natriuretic peptide? Is this something you're regularly using to diagnose patients? Yep, we all, we use uh, BNB or NT uh, pro BNB every day. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like uh, every, um, it is like routinely used for a patient with uh, mm -hmm. respiratory distress and mm -hmm. uh, we suspect that patient have heart failure. Yeah, sometimes we use it for a uh, run in or run out patient. Right. Out. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right, Dr. Hannah and Dr. Howell. Um, when I first started training in emergency medicine, BNP was, was very hot. Everyone wanted to use BNP to diagnose heart failure or not. But at least at the University of Utah now, BNP is more used to trend a patient who has established heart failure and uh, is coming in with new symptoms. So if the patient had a BNP of 500 six weeks ago in clinic, and is now seeing me in the emergency department and has a BMP of 1,500, I can say, yes, this is likely heart failure. So it, at least in our practice, the trend is much more important than saying yes or no. Is that how you were using it? Or are you saying yes or no, they have, they have heart failure? Uh, yeah, definitely. We will use the, the trend. It's more important than yeah. uh, number. Yeah. Yes, exactly. The trend is very good. So, and that's kind of what this says. More useful when compared to the baseline BMP. So, um, how are we managing these patients? This is really why you're here today. How, how do we manage these, these patients uh, from uh, the patient who is just barely symptomatic and may have a little volume overload to the patient with decompensated heart failure, which is a lecture that uh, we could give unto itself. So, I, I really think the initial approach is dictated by their hemodynamics, how sick they look, what their volume status is, and perhaps most important, what their respiratory status is. Are they in respiratory distress? Are they comfortable or are they, do they look like uh, they're going to die? So like everything in emergency medicine, we always do airway, breathing, and circulation first. So if the patient is an extremist and they have undifferentiated respiratory distress, of course you're going to intubate them first. But if you have a chance to slow down and think about it, the, the correct and first intervention is likely non-invasive uh, positive pressure ventilation, like BiPAP. We also use loop diuretics. We use vasodilators. Some people use morphine, and we're going to talk about that. Some people use ACE inhibitors. Some people use dobutamine. <clears throat> so let's talk about that. What about non-invasive ventilation? This is a New England Journal article that was published back in 2008. Uh, and this is just before I started residency. And in this article, uh, they wanted to find out if these patients had a better mortality compared to patients who were either intubated or not intubated. And in this article, uh, the, those patients who, who received BiPAP in the emergency department had no improvement in short-term mortality or need for intubation but they did have a rapid improvement in their shortness of breath, their heart rate, their acidemia, their hypercapnia. Um, and so that, that was really, for a while, we really, the debate still raged on. Does this actually improve outcomes or does it just improve symptoms? Well, recently in 2019, this large Cochrane Review study with 22 or 24 studies, excuse me, came out, really settled the matter. And it, it, it concluded that BiPAP showed decreased hospital in-hospital mortality and a decreased need for intubation, okay? Now, the downsides to BiPAP, at least in the emergency department, are it, that it requires really close monitoring. Uh, either the physician or the nurse or a respiratory therapist needs to monitor these patients very closely. Patients are often combative when they're that confused and hypercapnic. And to maintain a good mask seal is very difficult in some patients. So patient cooperation is also very important. 
these patients also need typically to have pretty good hemodynamics. And as we know, or as I alluded to, patients with late stage acute heart failure exacerbations may have uh, decompensation in their hemodynamics. They may have hypotension. Their blood pressure may be too low. And because uh, BiPAP and other non-invasive positive pressure ventilation impairs preload, it can cause a drastic uh, reduction in uh, uh, vasal return to the heart. And so you really need to be careful that this doesn't decrease cardiac output. Um, one stop that I, I, I wanted to make, and I put this in there to just to emphasize, you really gotta be careful in these patients not to over-oxygenate them. So if we over-oxygenate patients in acute heart failure, the hyperoxia can cause pulmonary vasoconstriction which can lead to worsened cardiac output, decreased cardiac output. So you should not, if, unless you need to, oxygenate these patients at 100% FiO2. Oftentimes these patients need more ventilation than oxygenation. And so simply supplementing their oxygen to 50 or 60% FiO2 is sufficient. Or starting with BiPAP, an FiO2 of 100% and titrating rapidly down to avoid the vasoconstriction in the pulmonary vasculature that we talked about. So what about patients that are hypertensive? We know that really bad hearts are sensitive to increases in afterload. So if a patient has a uh, really terrible systolic heart failure, but also really bad hypertension, uh, these patients can go south very quickly. Uh, they can get sick quite quickly. Uh, so what we need to do is rapidly lower the filling pressure to prevent a need for intubation of these patients and decompensa decompensation. And the way we do that is to give vasodilators as soon as possible, as long as the blood pressure remains elevated, okay? The vasodilators that we use in my emergency department are typically nitroglycerin. And the way we give it oftentimes, or the way I teach a resident to give it, is to give it sublingually while the nurse or the pharmacist is getting the IV medication ready. And Dr. Ryan mentioned this a little bit last week when he talked about giving sublingual taps akin to a, a typical dose, starting dose of IV nitroglycerin. So you can give three tabs of sublingual nitroglycerin while your nursing staff is getting together your IV nitroglycerin to get it ready or put on some paste, which I also think is less preferable. Nitroprusside is also really, uh, uh, really reasonable. If the nitroglycerin is not working, uh, it's, a, it's a far more potent arterial vasodilator and may help lower uh, mean arterial pressures. And then last but not least, loop diuretics. Uh, some patients require these. These don't act as quickly, obviously, as uh, the IV vasodilators. In normal tense of heart failure, we can simply address this with loop diuretics, loop diuretics, loop diuretics. <laughs> And those are furosemide, eumetanide, or torsemide, at least in the emergency department in the University of Utah. Um, this is a trial that showed uh, how much loop diuretic these patients should get. Uh, so classically in America, in emergency medicine, when a patient with known heart failure comes in and is on a diuretic, an oral dose, uh, we double that dose via IV and give them that dose. So uh, uh, why is this? Why do we need IV dosing in the emergency department? Uh, interestingly enough, heart failure can contribute to bowel wall edema, and it may prevent uh, the gastrointestinal absorption of loop diuretics if we give these patients oral loop diuretics. Uh, this dose trial, again, it's, it's over 10 years old, but uh, this was important in establishing how much loop diuretics we should be able to give these patients in the emergency department. The last but not least, this is the most fearful complication. What about decompensated heart failure exacerbation? These patients are very, very sick. These are some of the sickest patients uh, that I see in my emergency department. And they're the patients that I probably have the most fear about treating. We treat them typically with inotropes. Dobutamine is kind of the mainstay medication because it helps increase the contractility of, of uh, a weakened heart muscle. 
The problem with dobutamine is it paradoxically can cause hypotension or exacerbate hypotension. And so at least in our emergency department and in our practice in America, it's quite common to start dobutamine after or alongside norepinephrine or epinephrine. The epinephrine can increase myocardial oxygen demand and can be problematic. But again, uh, we feel that at least uh, uh, given alongside dobutamine, it should help offset some of that increased demand of the myocardium. Uh, again, in emergency department at the University of Utah, we often use it in conjunction with our cardiologist because these patients are so very sick. So these patients will go on to need some diuresis and in the most dire of cases uh, may need an intra-aortic balloon pump. And universally, these patients go to our cardiac ICU. So uh, we talked about the Forrester class at the beginning. Again, this just kind of helps you delineate who, should, who we should treat and how we should treat. You see these patients that are the warm and dry who uh, have the highest cardiac index and the lowest pulmonary capillary wedge pressure probably have the healthiest hearts. And the people with the cold and wet are the people who have the lowest cardiac uh, 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 index and the highest pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Um, does morphine work with these patients? Are you all routinely giving morphine? Why or why not? Sometimes we use morphine because yeah. uh, some patients are so... Uh, uh, so... Uh, so uh, Aside. Uh, anxiety. 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 Yeah. You're, you're right. And in, in the classic yes. the classic teaching, Dr. Howe, is to give morphine. But yes. lately we found in some of the, the more recent publications that morphine is associated with uh, increased adverse events and, and lower uh, lower uh, survival in these patients. And so of course yes. we want to treat patients well. But there is some suggestion that morphine, either because it impairs oxygenation or uh, has some other undetermined physiologic effect, may be associated with higher mortality. And so I have, I have taken to giving uh, less narcotics to my patients in heart failure and really just focusing on, on symptom control, uh, either by putting a fan that blows air on their face in front of them or, or putting on some nasal cannula underneath their BiPAP mask but I am using morphine less and less. So how about the situation in which patients have um, a myocardial infarction and it's called acute heart failure. So in this case, patients have, have a chest pain and we can use morphine. Right, so that's a great question, Dr. Hannah. The same is true. In fact, a lot of this literature comes from myocardial infarction, the American Heart Association publications on myocardial infarction and associated heart failure with myocardial infarction. So those patients also with myocardial infarction, we are no longer giving morphine to. Mm. Yeah, interesting, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what about nasiratide? So We didn't yeah. have any experience about uh, nasiratide because Perfect. we don't we, have nasiratide. We can skip it, but importantly, don't use it. It, it doesn't work. <laughs> so you're way, I got. You're, way, you're way ahead of us. Very good. What about ACE inhibitors or angiotensin uh, uh, renal uh, blockers or beta blockers? We don't use this. We don't use yeah, yeah. These, these are not medications. Again, uh, the cardiologists in America used to want to give these medications right away within the first 24 hours but no longer. There's, there's no good data to suggest we need to give it to these patients. And in fact, it may harm patients within the first 24 hours after their heart failure exacerbation, especially when associated with myocardial infarction. So in conclusion, heart failures is categorized in those four, four categories we talked about. Those being cold and wet have the highest mortality. Please, please, please use point of care ultrasound to evaluate your patients with dyspnea. Our treatment focuses on diuretics, afterload reduction, support of ventilation using BiPAP, and patients with decompensated heart failure are very, very difficult and scary, but use epinephrine or norepinephrine alongside dobutamine if you need to use it.
that is uh, my lecture for tonight, everybody. So I hope uh, you're all still awake. And now it's time for a uh, Cafe Suada. And uh, do you have any questions for me? Yes. Mm, yep. And um, Dr.